Well, football fans, welcome to Footy Prime. Shaman's here, Dunlop's here, Craig's here, sporting a lovely new pair of glasses, Craig. You know, they're not as bad as you said they were on the last last show. They look very uh, cerebral. Well, I didn't know what they were going to look like because I had that eye drop stuff put in your eyes that make you... (laughs) And then they and then they're showing me frames when I'm after that, John. It was ridiculous. So I, it was a shot in the dark, you as you can see. We've seen far worse, <laughs> I, I think. We should probably, because uh, Craig just gave away our, our guest before I had the chance to introduce him. Um, but now everyone's seen it. Well done, Craig. And glad that you uh, listened to the pre-production meeting once again. Um, John Herbin's here, <laughs> Canada's coach. I'm, I'm not looking forward to this. I'm, I'm a bit worried about this one, James. Right, he's <laughs> you not should already. Be. You should be a sweet prime. You know, we've been having a couple of pints and uh, not yourself, of course, but we are. But uh, welcome to the show, John. Thank you so much for joining us. What should be a really exciting uh, week ahead, I think, for for Canadian football fans. We're going to get to a ton of stuff today, including a quiz at the end that Craig's put together about your hometown. So so no pressure. We, we gave uh, Ozo one yesterday, actually, and uh, he aced it really well. Um, it wasn't about your hometown, just a that out there but I don't think was... anyone knows the concept <laughs> hey John so it was about three years ago now at a press conference you, you were saying how you know forget 2026 we're going to qualify for 2022 and oh how we all laughed and said wow this guy's confident eh? wow you know how can you say that and here we are now in 2021 and I for one would be surprised at this point if you don't qualify for 2022 um, now there's <laughs> There's much work to be done, but from what we've seen so far, it's been so impressive. So let's start off. What do you know about your your squad now that you didn't know even then when you made that that comment? I I, I think I just come out uh, the camp in Mercia where um, when that in and then we were announcing the the twenty cup. Um, and I think at the time a, a lot of the conversations were about twenty twenty six, but. I just sat in a room with a group of men in Mercia who all their life they've dreamed of playing at a World Cup. And, you know, you're in a position of influence. And if the leader's not saying we're going to qualify, what are you there for? I mean, <laughs> you've got to say it. You have to say those words. I remember people were saying, oh, you've just put your neck in a noose and you'll get fired if you don't. Well, you're going to get fired anyway. Like, you got to say it. You absolutely have to say it. And I think for some of the lads, they they were used to already those excuses that were going to be made around why we wouldn't. And you know, one, once you've said it, you're you, you're there now. You, you've got to deliver. And if people think you're mental, then that that's that's just going to be part of it. They they often think you are anyway. Win or lose. So. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was just making sure that the players heard that, that the players listened to all the media. They they read everything. They had to hear that we will, not, not that we might, we'll try. It, it had to be that sort of statement. And, yes, you know, when you're, you're flying on the, the plane home, you're like, oh, shit, what have I done? <laughs> but at the same time, <laughs> you, you know every morning now, 5.30, the alarm goes off. I've got to get this done now. You, you've got to get this done. But it was a no, gamble, John, right? So, John, sorry, I, um, sorry, sorry, sorry go ahead. Uh, it, it was a gamble, obviously, but since then, looking back, these players, I guess, have shown you that, yeah, they're up for the challenge. And they, they like that type of, I guess, motivation, motivation inspiration. Well, well what, I, what I knew, because, you know, you're not just going to throw this stuff out there. I think, you know, the, the research we've done coming into the role, we spent a lot of time. Like, I was given, like, a three-month period before – we had our first camp and and for me uh, with my staff we we just went right in to try and understand like what are we what are we in here like what are what are we dealing with we interviewed a lot of ex players some ex coaches we interviewed the whole squad like 40 plus players um to really understand like what were we dealing with why hadn't this country qualified and and the evidence that i was able to show the players like we we would categorize the players, right? The players in in tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, tier five. And that's based on where you play, what league you play in the world. And and whether you're a level one, whether you play in the top five teams or the bottom five teams. And what we were able to show over five cycles of World Cup qualification, Canada 
had the players. They had the players. They they were top five in CONCACAF for, mm. for over just under two decades. They were top five in CONCACAF. But we hadn't made the octagon or, or the world, the hex. But we were a top five team. When you went on paper, there was more quality in Canada than El Salvador, Panama, et cetera, et cetera. And every, every team would have a, a golden generation. So Jamaica, Trinidad, um, Honduras had their generation. And, and Canada, you could see our generation was, was bubbling. We started, we were able to show we, we've got three tier one players currently playing in those top levels in the world. At the time, it was Arfield, Hoylet, and one other. I can't remember who it was at the time. But you could see we had these potential tier one players. We were looking at players that were in. Jonathan David at the time wasn't playing high-level men's professional football, but he was in a tier one academy. Liam Miller, a tier one academy. Alfonso was just transitioning to Bayern Munich. So you weren't, this wasn't bravado. This wasn't just, hey, guys, we're going to do this, you know, Ted Lasso style. <laughs> you, you know, you're, you're in there showing them the data that we've always been a talented team. Mm-hmm. And we've got to figure out as a group what it is. And, and it revealed itself, Craig. You know, you've, you've lived in these men's national team environments. You've lived when you've had a team where you know they're going to fight for each other. It revealed itself in two camps, the first two camps. There was a, two punch-ups in Mercia. Like, and I'm talking like training ground bust-ups where you're like, what is going on here? Like, like nothing's really happened. It was a tackle, but it's a tackle that you don't do on your teammates. Eh? You, you know you don't do those tackles. Like it's, it, it's just a no-no. And then the second camp, it happened again. And in that camp, I went, okay, I'm going after this. And, and, and I pulled the leaders right in the moment. I stopped the session, said, enough, done. I pulled them. And there was a, a leadership group of six. And I went after them. You know, I, I said to them, I says, this is the most effing dysfunctional team I've seen. Like, that fight's just happened. The Scottish lads went in this direction, mumbling. The, the Spanish-speaking lads went in this direction, mumbling. The Eastern Europeans went this way and, and another group went that way. And you're like, that's the team. When the shit hits the fan here, this is who you are. And, and whether you want to admit this or not, and, and, and I guess one of them was trying to say, it's a, you know, it's a gender thing. You know, you know, men have these fights in training and, you know, it's not women's foot. And I was like, hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. When was the last time you just won anything? When was the last time you were at a World Cup? Come on. You've got to accept that there's a problem in this team. And unless you're willing to work on this leadership aspect and work when you get to camp and pry to camp, we're going nowhere. Mm-hmm. And it was a great moment. It was a, a brilliant moment because they knew I wasn't going to back down on this. Mm-hmm. And they knew that I was getting after it. And the next camp, the we brought in... People from the military um, who'd represented the country in in situations where they talked about where they'd seen, you know, people dying, their, their friends die. You know, a, a, a colonel came in and he spoke, and the guys like I, I wasn't allowed in the room. I didn't want to be part of that. I wanted them to have their moments, but it had a, a deep impact on them about what it means to to represent a maple leaf and what people mm. are prepared to do with it. So in that in that period they they started to develop the code of the shirt and for a lot of people these things become they, they become sort of gimmicky and cliched but for these guys it wasn't they, they started to to really sense that this is our way forward like we, we've got to, we've got to buy into something mm-hmm. like john we, when yeah. you were when you took over the team that first camp um, you must have felt a certain amount of pressure um, just from the fact that you're coming from the women's program. And whether you, you like it or not, we, whether we like it or not, uh, the fact of the matter is people talk about it. 
and the players would also talk about it. We did Jonathan Osorio, and he was never against it. But it was an interesting choice for a lot of the players. Yeah. After day one, he said everybody bought in. Everybody had a belief. And I knew that that would be the case because I know your background. I know who you are as a person. Um, but was there a certain amount of pressure on you because of that to prove yourself to them a little bit? I was myself. <laughs> 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 to put it politely. You right. Know, the- the, 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 I mean, I guess that's it. I mean, it was it was my real moment, you know, like you, you, you've been in the women's program when, when you arrived, you, you know, we had success quickly, which, which sort of bought you the, 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 the medal glow. And then we got success again. So it was repeated. So, so then what was happening is you, you were getting invited, you know, you were given a coach of the year award, this Jack Donahue award, and then you're getting invited to speak and all of these things. And, and it was like you were getting way too comfortable, eh? And you're starting to drink your own Kool-Aid. So, so that shift into the men's side, whew, it brought it brought us back right down to earth. Like, like, yeah, like I said, no one would really ever ask you any questions. People were asking you for advice and whatever. But in the first, I don't know, was it three weeks of that? It was it was a battering, you know, like you, you, we we battened down the hatches at home. <laughs> I was I was in the fetal position on my mentor's couch, you know. Well, what have I done? What what did I do here? This is this is crazy. Um, and and I guess at the time it was, you know, I think at the way it got announced that the the bit that I, I struggled with most was I felt I'd let the girls down, the women, because. You know, that it got leaked to the media and it was very political how everything happened. I mean, I'll, I'll write a chapter in a book one day about, you know, how it all unfolded. But, um, yeah, I had like one hour. I, I got the threat from a friend. Well, we got a threat from someone in the media that you've got one hour. I had one hour to contact Christine Sinclair and all the women to tell them I'm leaving. And and this is this is something that had been building you know, there was a plan in place that it wasn't even meant to be announced in early January. It was a, a process that was being undertaken through a period of time to get a, tr- a good transition. But what I learned is, you know, men's football, it's the Wild West. It really is the Wild West. Like, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the quick and the dead. <laughs> <laughs> one thing, one thing I'll ask you, one more question, John, for myself is that, one thing about international football, and a lot of people have to understand, is that tournament football is so much different than club football, and managing that is so much different. And you went to New Zealand uh, in two, well, you you certainly were there in the World Cup, I think, in 2007, 2011, you qualified, 2008 Olympic Games, I believe, as well, mm-hmm. as well as a couple under 20 tournaments as well. So I was adding these up, as well as the women's program, the Olympic Games, You've been to over a dozen tournaments. You know tournament football, and I know how difficult it is and the difference between those two. And people didn't realize that it doesn't matter whether it's women or men. It's the experience in those tournaments that were really put John in a very good situation and in qualifying and dealing with coming and goings of players that you don't see as much, although the women you probably saw a lot more of. Yeah, it, it, it is that. It, like in, international, is it's it's a different craft. It's you know cl- club football, as you know, it's the day in day out. It's it's managing so many other aspects. And what, what what's interesting, Craig, in that period, I think it was November. It was a real turning point in in my career because there was a big international opportunity that that was offered. And then I was in conversations with a club, a, a football, a men's club, to be transitioned into the first team head coach's role. And I, I remember the conversation with, with the people. I'm not ready for that. But if I'm going to transition into men's football, like I've got to learn to work with men first. 
And I'm not saying there's a massive difference between working with men and women because high performance is high performance. Getting the best out of people is getting the best out of people, but you needed that transition. And club football would have been two steps way too far. And, and all, all my mentors have always said, never extend yourself too far, never. Like you've got to have self-awareness enough to know one step at a time. So it was a really interesting you know, time in, in my life. I could have went with an organization that were plowing millions of dollars into their international football team or on a pathway into men's club football. And the, the bit that I, I really made us stay here is my craft was international football. And I genuinely was pissed around what was happening in Canada. We had gone back to back podiums. We'd done something that had never been done in over a century, but the budget hadn't changed on the women's side. And we were pushing, we were, we were, I, I was knocking on doors behind the scenes with other staff members trying to get and people in the organization, people engaged to get a pro league, a pro league team even in Canada. And there's just, there's no budget. There's no, there's no resource to really get things moving. So I'm looking at, we were fourth in the world and I'm going, how do we get to number one? And, and, you know, Bev Priestman's took them there, which is brilliant. And that, that to me is, I didn't, I couldn't see how I could get there. I couldn't see it. I knew we were there or thereabouts, but I couldn't see that path. But what I could see is even if I did get there, the same budget was going to turn up. We, we had to do something on the men's side because all of the countries that have been successful on the women's, and I did research in Japan in 2010 about what, when they held a World Cup, they never not qualified after. And what it's done for the game, even Australia, and when they had the golden generation qualified, they've never not qualified after. And they've been able to professionalize women's and men's leagues. Mm -hmm. It's the World Cup is the tipping point. And I think in 86, the dollars probably weren't the sort of dollars that can really make a change in a game. And in New Zealand in 2010, when I'm the technical director, the All Whites qualified first time in a quarter of a century. We got about nine, ten million dollars into our coffers, and we, we ignited the whole grassroots program. And I'm going, if this men's team never qualify, this this women's team are never moving forward. Grassroots coaching isn't. We're never going to be able to put the infrastructures in place. So when I was asked, I guess the question, you know. What's it going to take to keep you here? I said, the only thing I can impact with my skill set, and I genuinely believe we can bring things across because I've seen what's lacking, I can impact on the men's side. Now, that's your choice whether you think that's the right thing for me to do. But, you know, outside of that, I can go here or I can go there. Or, you know, I stay in Canada, which I'm raising two Canadian kids now who love the place. How how aware of the men's program were you throughout your time with the women's program? Were you aware that there were these these gems, these diamonds coming through the system and that if you took the job at that time, it's going to be great timing because that's going to be the time when they can break through? No idea. No idea. I just remember being in, you know, meetings where it's like, what are we doing? Like, we need our men's team to qualify. Like, what's happening there? And... You know, some of the things that I was shown, it really used to upset us um, because yeah, you're in certain high performance situations in, in meetings that you're seeing things that you're, you're scratching your head and you're hearing things that you're scratching your head. Like, how, how, how is this allowed to happen? The difference is that on the women's side, on the podium are the high performance watchdog. So they'll invest 10 million over a four year period into a program. But what they're going to do, Craig, guys, they're going to look at it and go, well, what are you investing in? Where's your sports psychology? Where's your sports science? Where's your quadrennial planning? Where's your periodization? How are you acclimating through these periods? How, how are you dealing with security? And, and all, all of your, every plan we put together was micro analyzed by high performance experts. So on the men's side, what I could see is no one was doing that. The, 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 there was no real watchdog that was saying, 
well, what is your, your periodization through the year? Like, what's the efficiencies here around your spending? Um, and that's, it's not been critical to, to, to that side, but when you're living in this world and you're, you're having to create a, literally a 200-page document before you can even get on the grass, and then in this world, there's nothing. That's that, that's that's what would frustrate us. That mm-hmm. yeah. So well, that was the thing, John. From our players' point of view, for years and generations of players that saw this lack of professionalism and and leadership to a path of success, and that was consistent, and it was frustrating for all the players. It was it was almost like, I mean, all the Canadian teams ever played in were tight. Like we talk about a brotherhood, it, we, there's, it was almost because nobody really gave a shit about us. So we didn't care type attitude. We weren't supported at home. We weren't supported anywhere, but we supported each other. But there was a lack of professionalism to, to the point where is if we were going to compete in the sport where every country plays it, there's 41 countries that are competing in CONCACAF alone. We need to be at the very best at the very, very best, if we're going to have a chance to qualify for the World Cup. And I'm glad to see that that's happening. And John Osorio talked about it and and uh, clearly sees that that is a, a difference. Although he, well, he would have seen a bit of a transition as he's 29 now, but it's, uh, it's, it's so much different and the players see it and they feel it. Yeah, and, and again, I think, you know, I had to go through that process. I mean, in coming in, we spent a lot of time building it, like a high performance review that 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 hadn't been done at, at, at the sort of level because you've been trained in the, the Olympic system, even in New Zealand. New Zealand had a great sports system, Olympic system, and you were trained in how to create these these system plans. And and knowing that you ain't going to the Olympics unless this plan is world class. So mm. so in coming in. We were able to identify a lot of gaps, and ultimately, it took us a year. And I cleaned out, Craig. I had to clean out a lot of the the staff there, and and that again, it's not being disrespectful because a lot of people have put a lot of hard work in to the team. But at the same time, I just knew there was standards and habits that that needed to change, um, and. A lot of what, what we've had is transitioning women's staff across to the men's side. So now, like in our dynamic, there's always a minimum of four female staff in the environment. For me, it's absolutely critical in high-performance environments that you have this, this dynamic going on. And mm-hmm. that, that, that was, a, I think, a big shift, having Robin Gale as the, the cultural and, and mental performance Someone who's focused on that cultural piece. Why? Because th- that's what we've struggled with. So we need someone to focus on that. And we brought across the sports scientist. We brought across the goalkeeping coach. Um, we brought across the, the head of medicine and therapy. And these people have got metal experience in our sport, football, on the women's side, but also they've worked across multi-disciplines, whether mm. it was speed skating, so, so you're bringing in top Canadian uh, brains into the environment. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's easy to sit here and go, oh, yeah, I did this. I've got great people in the environment, and I surrounded the men with top, top-class people. Like you meet a Robin Gale, top, top-class individual. The, the, the players will go, you know, without Robin, I don't, know, I don't know where we'd be, you know. And that's, you know, I, I get to sit on these podcasts, but – it's the people we've put around this team which show them we care. Mm-hmm. It, it does seem crazy at this level then to essentially professionalize the program, which is what's happened the last number of years. Um, we're seeing players now not perhaps see it as a destination, but as a far more attractive choice than in previous years. With We saw Ugbo, for example, just you know committing yesterday, you know, a huge moment for, for this program. Do you get the impression when you speak to you know your players, club coaches or people around the world – the program is getting more respect. It is seeing it as a, a legitimate place for players to play and, and a respected place by other clubs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I say, it's been a, a perfect storm. I mean, you've got the, the Davies 
factor. I mean, there, there, there's no doubt. Like, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say me, the staff, and this group of players have have changed the narrative. I mean, Alfonso Davies has has came into the, the Canadian football world and turned it upside down, and, <laughs> and that's yeah. Yes. You know, that, you can't deny that. You know, I, I know, I know, I can coach, right? I know I can put systems and, and stuff together, but he's he's special, eh? And, <laughs> he's and a game changer. He is. He's a game changer. He's, off the field, though, we know it's not just his off. ability, right? He's got that mm-hmm. that charisma that you can sell a brand, and that sounds boring uh, as a media person, but it is important for the game in this country to have those personalities who can do sure. on the field, of course, number one, but. He's just as compelling off the field as well. He's really the complete package. He is. He is. And and in this environment, it's brilliant because they play that little keep you up game and he still gets the slaps on the back of the head. And <laughs> he, he, you know, he's he's just he's allowed to be a, a young man here and and not have to shoulder that responsibility. That's what I love about the team we've created. Like Milan, the juniors, the Daniels, the Tibas. Uh, the Jonathan Azario, who's, who's turned into a, a, a fabulous leader over, you know, the three and a half years that I've been here, the shift in him has been phenomenal. Like when you talk about someone that's moved from me to we, um, yeah, next level. And and it, those guys, uh, they know he's he's important and they, they let him be him. And, and I think that's important. They know he's, you know, at times in, in training, he's going to over dribble and, 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 yeah, we, we just let him be him. Uh, no one's going to two foot him and 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 you know do the things that try to keep him <laughs> his feet on the ground. They just they just let him be him. So he's special, guys. And I, I think I don't have to tell you 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 lot this. I mean, I mean, Craig, if 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 you had Alfonso back in '86 and through that next era, yeah, I mean, what would have happened to Canada then? But we we've got him now, and I think what's what's brilliant is. Like, Fonzie's doing his thing, but then it, it's like the higher tide, it's floating all the boats. And I don't know if I've got that saying right. I'm from Fonzie. <laughs> hey, man, you're on the right podcast for that. Don't worry. We have no Is that it? Is it? Uh, I don't know. Really. Look at the Words don't matter. We just use them. It's okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. But anyway, long, long story short on that, you're seeing Johnny now, like a uh, French champion. Like that year we had last year. Johnny yeah. wins the title. Atiba and Kyle do the double. Spoonie goes and and and, and cracks the Scottish Cup. Um, I might have missed Scotty Arfield won the uh, the championship at Rangers. That's um, right. Yeah, I mean there was also Milan, Milan, Milan and Serbia. Yeah, yeah, and on it the was, women's side too. It was champions on the women's side through and through. What? Yeah, you, you know, you've peaked, John. The program's peaked. Uh, Jeez. <laughs> No, no, it's, now? It's, well, we've got it. Hey, we've got yeah, it. yeah. Now you set your standards, John. You're in trouble. But it, 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 this trouble. this summer is a really good representation of how kind of quickly the game as a whole has has elevated. And if you look at, you know, it used to just be a celebration for Canadian fans to have Canadian men's players in those six leagues that we were talking about. They're champions in those six leagues, and on on the women's side at these at these major clubs to have that list all at the same time. I think it was. 11 champions and i'm sorry if i'm missing any but from that that, you know that's incredible and to see from the announcement in 2018 your appointment in the men's program where you know you you referenced the world cup uh hosting the world cup being a real turning point but it's the build and the preparation to that turning point that i think has the country so excited and on both sides i think where the men's program is now in this run in the octagon with as you say still a long ways to go and the women having just won the gold the impact that both of those will have in the lead up I think is immeasurable and something as Canadian fans, we're all happy to see and, and couldn't have you know, really imagined in 2018. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, it's all, all we, we dream of. Like it's, you, you, you think of being able to watch a world cup with your kid. That That's mm. the, like, for me, that's the mark of it. Cause I just remember what that meant to me. And maybe I'm living in a, in a dinosaur era, but like I say, you're in the Azteca and I remember watching that 86 World Cup and watching me dad cry, you know, when Maradona scored that goal. Like, and then I'm in the Azteca a couple of weeks ago and I'm, I'm thinking, how the hell am I here? Like, <laughs> but more importantly, it's those moments that turn people on to football forever, you know? They're, they're the sort of, we, I think we had a tipping point with the women in 2012 and, and 
in just turning the women's game onto our team. And then they've had that big moment in, in winning the gold. I think the men are, are waiting for that. And we know it's, it's going to change this landscape forever. Um, mm-hmm. But I think I, I want to just touch on something there because you, you mentioned the, the summer and I think the Gold Cup was was a really important one for us. The mm-hmm. um, I think we, we Davies is, is an important part of this. Jonathan David and, and, and a lot of what we've talked about is the success of those players. And But at that Gold Cup, those guys weren't there. And I think that, for me, was the most important moment in the turning point for this team. The, the, the dominant performance against Costa Rica, which, which showed without our five usual start and spine of the team, that we were able to dominate the team that are normally third in CONCACAF. That's like a, that was a critical moment for us, and we know where their program's at. But then to come out against Mexico and just get after them the way the way the lads did and we had a strategy to sit in for a period to absorb and then there was a you know a point in the game we were going to go after them and when they went after them it just showed we can compete with anyone and the belief in the Azorios the Mark Anthony Kears the Maxime Crapos the Kamal Millers the Alistair Johnsons it, it was really important for them to now come into this qualification campaign to say, we think we can beat any team in CONCACAF without Davies, without David. And and it was just being in there, like you, you, when you talk about that, that tightness, Craig, when it comes together, that was the moment, like I really feel felt the team feel like it was where I had the women's team in 2012 mm. in, in that Olympic period. Like there, there was pre that Mexico game, I could smell the belief in the room and, and the togetherness that if there's a fight tonight, they're all in. And, and it was that they did. They got, they got well, We in. saw that, didn't we, last game? <laughs> well, well, in the Mexico game, it, it kicked off there and, and that set the precedence because I, I don't know if Fonzie's a fighter. I think he's more of a lover. But, you know, all, all of these guys know they've got to be in. They've got to be yeah. in the fight now. So that, that thing happened in the corner. And I'm trying to shift the tactics to a 4-4-2 because we're starting to lose momentum. And all I see is all the whole bench piling down. And, and then I'm looking down and I'm thinking, Fonzie's in the middle of this. Don't put him a red card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, but you know what? Canadians, I mean, hey, listen, we're, we're simple folk. We love that kind of stuff. We love that shit. It's oh, amazing, yeah. you know, and, and it yeah. does, it, it will, I think, draw a mainstream audience in when they might see that and then we can educate them about the uh, the nuances of the game. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just been an incredible year and obviously the work's still to be done here, but I think it's a great point with that Gold Cup because it showed, I think, the fans and the media that this team can win in different ways. You don't need to rely on, on the funsies and the Kyles and these players. You can do it with the Estacios having a standout, you know, campaign, the Ozos. So depth is something that the team hasn't had before, I don't think. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, me to we. Well, let's turn it on you now, John, from from me to we. We want to go from we to me. Uh, we've got a little quiz here that, that Craig's put together. He spent hours and hours formulating these questions. About it's the most he's ever worked. Uh, he's never yeah. prepared for a show uh, ever. In, in oh, what, how many years? Ten this. years, welcome to Craig? Never All night long, before. I was working on it. So, Craig, take it away, mate. Okay. And it, it should be, well, I mean, <laughs> it's going to be pretty straightforward, but we want to learn a little bit about you. And we just want to know if you and you, your history and also your knowledge of your hometown in the county of Durham, which was Consett. And uh, first question will be, what is the population of Consett? Oh, I think it's grown since, since I've left. <laughs> Gosh. You uh, haven't. No, no, I haven't. No, no, I haven't. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm shrinking. That's it. I never thought I'd shrink. <laughs> anyway. Uh, age. So I'm going to go 62,100. Wow. 28,000 people. I was going to say 30, and then I kept it because I thought it had grown since I left. Eh? You're an optimist, yeah. aren't you, by nature? <laughs> yeah. But, oh, question oh. two. There's quite a few footballers have come from Consett, um, but I could only find one that actually played for England. 
He played for Liverpool, played for Southampton. I think he played for Sunderland as well. Larry Venison. There you go. Yeah. I was going to say he fancies himself a little bit too, but the yeah. best hair in the game, wasn't it? Yeah, the best hair in the game. He did. That's right. <laughs> yeah. What a flow. And I had that. Robson, Brian Robson when I just had... down the road. What was What's that? Brian Robson just down the road as well. Bobby Robson just down the road. You yeah. Unbelievable. Well, no neighbors. Yeah, I'm yeah. Mr. Bean. Wow. I'm Mr. Bean. He's from Concert. Oh, well, you just ruined one of my questions. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what other show is Mr. Bean on? What other show is he on? Famous. Oh, Black Adam, man. Black yes, Adam. yes. I knew you'd know that. Elizabethan Black Adam was the best one, wasn't it? Yeah, I think. Baldrick. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the scabby Baldrick. The yeah, scabby one. That's right. The boy was brilliant. Yeah. He was brilliant. Hey, okay, so here's one. There's been a, a coach recently, a woman coach, that has done very well uh, at the Olympic Games. For what country and who is she? That would be Beverly Bite Your Ankles Priestman. And, and Can that, you believe? That was, our, that was our nickname. Can you believe oh, wow. that we have two coaches for our program? They're from the same small town. That is incredible. Did you know her beforehand? Absolutely. I used to coach her when she was 13. So oh, that's for the nickname. That's story. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So she, she was part of my Brazilian Brazilian soccer schools. And yeah, she'd be there every single night just trying to get extra training. And similar to me, she, she wasn't very good. So she became a coach. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing, though. That must be pretty special for you guys, you, you know, with the two of you. And that conversation, what did that what was that conversation after you gave her a call, I would imagine, when they won the gold medal? Oh, she's like my little sister, you know. She's uh we we she's a godparent of my my daughter and we we've yeah, we've been together all our all our lives, but it's it's just a change. It's it's a change, like she's the boss now. That's it, she's the boss. So th this happens, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. All, all all our lives, she's always been like she came to New Zealand with us. She came to Canada with us, um, and it's one of them where it's like uh, you, you'd be the mentor, but now she's the she's the gaffer, she's the <laughs> boss. I got to ring her for advice now and selections and tactics. So she's got a gold medal hanging around her, her neck. I only oh. got. I only got the brown. <laughs> oh, wow. Just, just the brown, eh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> outside of this, well, I'll ask you one more question in the quiz. Uh, former referee, or still refereeing, actually, very high rated, highly rated, most recently, and uh, was the referee for yeah, the final yeah, yeah. 2016. <laughs> you know already? Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, he's got a nice haircut and some good tattoos, and yeah. He's the coolest okay. referee in the world, isn't he? He is the coolest. He is. He's, he's, he thinks he's he like is the, anyway. He's, he's the Beckham. And he, it's they, Mark. Mark. And the second name's going to come to us. Clattenburg. That's right. <laughs> he's from Black Hill. I used to live on top of the hill, and he lives just down the hill. She has a referee. totally different personality than from people that normally come from that area. <laughs> oh, well, you mentioned Barry Venison. Uh, well, that's <laughs> true. That's true. I mean, John, before as well, before about, about your actual hometown, you you grew up uh, there when it was there was high unemployment. The steel mill had shut down. I think in 1981, yeah. there was about 35, 36 percent unemployment. Uh, what was it like growing up in that town for you? And did you feel that growing up? And then that did that inspire you to work hard in football, even if you couldn't be a player? I think uh, if, if you lived in, in concert, it's rough. It was rough. That's a rough part of the world to, to grow up at that time. You know, I think things things have probably shifted now, but there was a lot of depression and that was a, that was a tough, a tough era. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate. My, all my family worked at the steelworks and, and my dad, he, he got a good job um, coming off that uh but well, that's a rough part of, part of the world. Anyone will tell you, like concerts, it's rough. But good people, like hard, like you've said, like they're hardworking people and they'll give you the shirt off the backs. They're, they're good people. They're, 
Like you, you have a good night out in concert. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Newcastle was my introduction to England. A weekend in Newcastle was my introduction to England. The yeah, best I'm, night out, eh? Oh, the yeah. best. This is that Jordan Shore era too. Yeah, we have fun with Brendan for this. You know, he's his first time going to England ever, right? He's going with his mates. He can go anywhere in England, right? Anywhere, and he chooses Newcastle. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's Newcastle. Did you get to the big market, Brendan? Of course. The Tiger Tiger was the big thing at that oh point. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, wow. I loved it up there. That was great. That yeah. was quite a taxi ride for you back in the day, though. Right? It's about a half an hour from Consett, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know it. You know it. Look at this guy. Save up, save up a month to go to Newcastle. Right. Yeah. Facts. facts with the facts. Wikipedia Craig, we'll call him. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, John, thank you so much. Uh, stick around. We've got one more thing to do with you. But um, after after we, we say farewell for this podcast, uh, good luck. In the coming week or so, it's going to be a great week for Canadian football. It's been uh, so much fun so far. And I think you've got a whole bunch of new believers and new fans uh, growing in the country. So, John Herbin, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.